Mix them up, let's start the show. We're digging in with Trey. 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 We're digging in with Trey today. Yeah. Well, it's time for my Canes November Dig In Player of the Month. And I have this backdrop because my presenting sponsor is Casual Elegance Designs, making interior spaces come to life. And I just finally, long time coming, it's just the first inning of what Casual Elegance is going to do for me, but they painted my joint. Oh, the great, huge Caniac Lori Moscato. And she, she sold me on this color. I would have a real dog, a Labradoodle like my buddy back in Michigan, the great Fred, but I travel too much. I don't feel that I would be uh, giving, um, I'm trying to think, it would be Frank. That would be the name of my Labradoodle, named after the huge Caniac Frank Sinatra. So that's why this guy ain't real. But Casual Elegance Designs, NC.com, from start to finish, and I'm just in the primary uh, pr preliminary portion of the tour with regards to it. Uh, they do a wonderful job. And thanks to them, uh, when I looked at uh, the hurricanes in the month of November, it was a no-brainer. Uh, Tony D'Angelo, before he tested positive for COVID, was uh, uh, at the top of the leaderboard with regards to production from the blue line. He's been an electrifying difference maker on the back end. I, I've always loved the type of bite that he plays with on the ice. I think that'll become more and more valuable as the, the games become more and more important. So I am very happy to present Tony with the shuffle as the Hurricanes Player of the Month for November. Before we dig in with Tony, I, I remind you that uh, our ever-growing merchandise line can be found at digintrip.com. And please rate and review our show honestly on all audio platforms as well as YouTube. Congratulations to Tony D'Angelo, the Canes Dig In Player of the Month for November. Tony, congratulations. Um, right now the team is, they're digging in for you. Uh, they miss you, but you led the way in all categories in November. You've earned the shovel. But first of all, just your reaction. Congratulations, my friend. Oh, thank you. I'm looking forward to getting the shovel. I wish we could have got it in person today, but uh, looking forward to seeing it soon. I appreciate it. Appreciate the award from you. Tony, um, new team. Uh, what have been your impressions? I, I, I watched you behind the scenes. Aside from being on the ice, you just seem to be thoroughly enjoying your time as a Carolina Hurricane. Yeah, so far so good. I mean, I had, uh, you know, last year, obviously, when I left the Rangers, I had a list of teams that I thought would be that I thought would be good fits. And I think the Carolina was, you know, in the top two or three there the whole way through into the, you know, while the season was still going on last year and then into the off season. And obviously it wound up working out with mutual interest. And, and now to get here and, and get around the guys and stuff, they've been fantastic. It's been, it's been like walking into a, you know, a team that I've been on for three or four years. It took me all of, all a month to become one of the louder guys in the room and, you know, and uh, on and off the ice, just getting along with the guys. So I'm usually a little bit of a shy, shyer guy at first. It takes me a little bit to get going. Once I, once I loosen up, it's, it's total opposite of shy. I don't shut up. But uh, it's been it's been really good. A lot of good guys in the locker room, great leadership, and just good people. So it's been a lot of fun so far. You know, this experience that I want to point to and get your reaction to right now is was not part of your November shovel. It was it was late in October, and I, I you know I've been here in Carolina a minute, and this was one of those cool moments when you completed the Gordy Howe hat trick. You had a goal and assist, and you dropped the gloves. You were going to the box, and the Caniacs were chanting. Big time, your name. Did you hear it immediately? And, and what did that mean to you? Because I thought it was really cool. Yeah, that was one of the uh, one of the coolest moments of my career so far. Having the, you know, obviously there's coolest times when you score goals and assists and all that kind of stuff. But to have the fans chant your name like that and uh, you know twenty thousand strong was a special feeling for me, especially after what I went through in the summer with uh, you know some positive and negative reactions. I guess split down the middle with coming here to have everybody kind of united on the, on the same side and cheering for me and, and appreciating the way I play for the team and, and the effort I try to put in to help the Hurricanes win. That meant a lot to me. So special moment, something I won't forget anytime soon. I think that it brought myself and the uh, Hurricanes fans a lot closer. Yeah, no doubt about it. And 
a lighter moment when you were named the first star after that game and a, a very memorable trick or treating surge. I meant to go out and get a Twix this morning because you sat on the bench with Abby Labar because there were Milky Ways there that you're a Twix guy. Why are you a Twix guy? Yeah, it was just something that came out. I think uh, she, I don't know if somebody had bitten that Milky Way or whatever, but there was a piece that ripped off or they were messing around with it. But uh, she said it's Twix there. I said, no, I'm a Twix guy. So I like Twix. It's not one of my favorite things. Just something I blurted out. But the, uh, the bench I interview there, like I said, it was just as, you know, just as special as the chanter in the game. The crowd just, uh, you know, I would talk and they would cheer and I kind of had to hold and then wait for them to wait for them to settle down. So really fun night. They like, uh, they like passionate hockey and I'm glad I could, glad I could bring that for them. Well, I'm sure they all want to know then TD, what is your favorite candy bar? As uh, chocolate bar, probably be a Kit Kat, I guess. Candy though, Sour Patch Kid, believe it or not. So am I. Sour Patch, my first <laughs> NHL training camp. On an off day with all the per diem that I got, I went to a movie theater and got like three bags of Sour Patch Kids. And somehow I was so into the Sour Patch Kids, I lost all my per diem. That was in Hartford. Kit Kats. <laughs> Boy, I, I, some people have called me a twit, not trip at times. Uh, moving on. You... I mean, I had observed this as a New York Ranger, and it's only been magnified as a hurricane. What an elite passer of the puck you are. So, and you train young hockey players in the Philadelphia area. When you look at the boxes that have to be checked to be a difference-making passer in the NHL, what are those boxes? I think in the NHL, the number one part is deception, right? You can't, you can't telegraph your passes. I think if you're, if you're staring at the guy you want to pass to, it's going to get picked off. These guys are so good. But just being able to being able to see guys, I think the best person I've ever seen do it was Panarin, and I tried to learn a little bit from him. And the way he would just, you know, he'd give you that look in the corner of his eye, and then he was able to – he knew where you were. He knew if you were left or right-handed, obviously, just from being on the team with you. But if if he looked at you, he just needed to look once, and there was no look again. He didn't need to telegraph it, and boom, that pass comes to you a second later. So deception, to me, is the biggest thing. you got to be deceptive with your passes. And then you got to know – you know, I was, we were talking about this before, about the right time to, to put pace on it, to not put pace on it, where a guy wants it, if he's going to get ready to shoot it. You know, if, he, if he's, if you're trying to stretch him, you can fire it at him because, you know, he's got time to receive and then get skating. If he's, if he's looking to shoot, you might want to take a little bit off it so he can get, you know, he can get a one-timer or it depends. So I think it's not overly complicated. I'm trying, I'm probably making it sound a little more complicated than it is, but just knowing the right times to put pace on it, not to put pace on it and, and making sure you're not telegraphing it. Good stuff. You know, when we were in Seattle on Thanksgiving Eve, you made that behind the back pass to Brendan Smith. I remember my first year broadcasting, one of the, the greats among greats in the NHL, War 77 on the Hurricanes, Paul Coffey. That was a Paul Coffey-like uh, pass. Um, what do you remember about that play? And then I want to get to your hockey IQ in the bench interview the next game in Philadelphia, because that was, that was marvelous. Yeah, well, I mean, that's kind of some of my favorite uh, chances to make plays. I got it. Exactly what happened as a as a defenseman is what you want. The puck kind of comes up the wall and takes a bounce, right? So it goes through our winger and their winger, the guy that's supposed to be covering me. So Seattle's F two, the guy that would be covering Schmidt, right? Or kind of monitoring Schmidt at least. If you're, you know, it depends how they're playing. He comes across trying to help the other guy, and that's the perfect time for me to to make a behind the back play to Schmitty because I have Schmitty wide open. There's nobody covering him over there. So I get two guys coming at me. The puck kind of bounces in a perfect spot for me to make that play. So instead of just throwing a, a nothing shot towards the net, you just hold it for a second, spun it over to Schmitty, and then Schmitty takes a bomb and you get a big time screen in front of the net by Jordo. And those are the kind of plays as an offensive guy you're, you're always looking for when you can get two guys to come at you and when you still have a little bit of time, and that means, that means somebody's open somewhere. You just got to find it. You moved me seamlessly into my next question. Now, I wouldn't have known this, truthfully, uh, calling your games uh, when you played for the Rangers. And I talked to video coach Chris Huffine about it. Chris Huffine's been around since the Greensboro days here. Your hockey IQ, just look at the way you just break down, you broke down Seattle's defensive zone coverage. Your hockey IQ is through the roof. Now, again, the fact that you, you develop young hockey players, Tony, is that something that you just have hockey IQ? Is it something you can teach? Is it a little bit of both? And how do you define it? It's, it's a little bit of both. You know what? I mean, this, this may sound a little, a little typical of an answer, but I've always told the kids that I train, I said, listen, I can't teach you 
every little hockey IQ and we're on the ice stuff, you know, we're, we're basically doing a lot of skill work and skating work and all that kind of stuff, shooting. But I always believed in watching hockey, right? So when I was a kid, I watched, I was a diehard Flyers fan as a kid. And I watched hockey every night the Flyers were on. I watched hockey unless I was at, you know, I was at practice, which was a good amount too. But if I could watch the Flyers, I was watching. And then as I got older, I was starting to watch defensemen, right? So I would watch whoever it was. I, I was at like um, Dan Boyle. I kind of thought I was similar size stature, Eric Carlson, guys kind of like that as I was, as I was coming through junior. And you started to pick up on all these little plays they make. Rather than just watching the game as a fan, you're looking at the little bump plays in the middle when they hold and go forehand to backhand and pop one or, or a little patience when the four checkers on him and they know he's not going to pressure the whole way as they hold it and then buy themselves a little bit of time. So in my opinion, watching hockey is the easiest way to learn it. For example, my, my old man never played hockey, right? But he watches hockey since, I don't know, it's probably before I was born now. And he's learned enough that me and him are on the same wavelength now after a game, if I talk to him, that he knows what I was thinking. So his hockey IQ has, has grown just from watching me play and from watching hockey his whole life. And he never played. So picture a guy that plays and is, is involved in it, learning the game as well and taking the time to taking the time to do it. So that's what I, you know, tell the kids to do. I tell their parents and watch hockey with them, you know, learn it, learn it together. Cause then they see like the, the most important thing in, in my opinion is patience. If you don't have patience, unless you're just that good at everything else, you don't have patience. In my opinion, you're not going to be very good. If you don't have patience and, and obviously you need to have a bunch of other things too. But patience is so big to me. And I think if you watch the game enough, you can learn that. And that's where the hockey IQ comes in. Because once you have patience, everything else should be a little bit easier for you. Patience. Now, I'm going to share a quick story with you just because it seems right. Because I did talk to uh, Paul Coffey about you. He was on his way to uh, Aruba. Uh, and Good spot. <laughs> it was on this trip. So speaking of patience, years ago, Paul had set me up with his sister-in-law, Suzanne. I would have been overachieving. Wonderful, wonderful <laughs> woman. And so as the cane sojourn through uh, Manitoba and then Alberta, he asked me for dinner in Calgary, and he's just him and I. I mean, it's Paul Coffey. And so we're in a Japanese steakhouse, and he's looking across, you know, the table as, you know, they're cooking right in front of you. They leave for a sec. He goes, hey, Trip, you ready to get serious with Suzanne? And, and I'm like, no. And he goes, well, then cut her loose. And so he didn't have any patience. And of course, I, I cut her loose. We're great friends to this day. She's married with a few kids. I just, I share that because it seemed right. Because I talked to Paul about you, your hockey club, you know, it, it, not having you and Brett Pesci, thankfully Ethan Bear is back. These are, these are big losses. So as difficult as it is to watch from afar, how can this stretch help your already closely knit group be better in the long run? Well, it shows our depth because I think that Chatfield and Lajoie have come in and played really well, you know, and we obviously knew they were good players before. So it's not overly surprising to any of us, probably, you know, they're guys that are NHL caliber players, but this is depth of the organization has been very good, but obviously me and Pesh bring a little bit uh, different, you know, we both play power play and, you know, a lot of, we eat up a lot of the power play minutes and, and regular, even strength minutes. So it's definitely, you know, anytime you're losing Bearsy just got back, obviously, which is a big, big pickup for us to get Bearsy back. You're losing a lot of minutes, right? And guys that play a lot for you and losing Marty now, you didn't have Svechi a couple nights ago. So I think it's actually as bad as it is for us, you know, missing and it's terrible having to watch and stuff on TV. We want to be out there so bad helping the guys. It's good. It's good for the team. There's adversity, right? There's a, you know, you have to guys have to step up when the other guys have to step up and our star players have to become even more star players when, when guys are gone. So I think it could help the team long-term. I think the guys have played really well. They could have you know, easily won all three of these games so far. They've only won one. And I think that uh, this test coming up here, hopefully be able to join the team on the trip at some point, but this trip coming up is a big test. You got really good Western Canadian teams. They're all playing well this year, Winnipeg, Calgary, Edmonton. And uh, it's a good test for our team. We have a deep, group right we got a deep group we got great leadership on the on the team and guys that go out and play hard every night so I don't have any worries I think that we're going to become a stronger team from it guys are going to take steps and we just show up our depth too so we'll be we'll be fun I when the hurricane signed you I reached out to three guys who I have supreme respect for uh Brady Shea former Diggin guest your current teammate former teammate yeah. in New York Adam Fox fellow Harvard guy uh and Former dig in guest, Mark Stahl. Just scored a big goal the other night. I, I, I want to specifically ask you 
about the role. Uh, you have his brother as your captain now, but the role that Mark has played in shaping your career. Huge. I, uh, I say it all the time. I've said it in a million, in a million interviews, you know, when they ask, everybody's looking for, you know, I don't know what they're looking for for me to say, but the guy that was most important to, to my career as a person, you know, as a player too, we were, I thought we were such a, you know, a strong pair we had, and we were so close off the ice too, Mark and I. So he's a great guy. We sat next to each other at the, uh, at the game rink. We sat next to each other at the practice rink, always, you know, BSing and, and having a good time. He's a, he's a fun guy. And, uh, just a good person and a great leader played the game the right way. He was, he was good for me on the ice defensively. And, you know, I'm a passionate guy. There was times where I was getting fired up or something. And Mark thought I was, thought I was getting myself away, you know, maybe away from the game. He was right there. And, you know, what he did was worry about me sometimes as, you know, during the game when he's supposed to be worrying about, you know, his own game and stuff. He's he's trying to focus on his own game and he'd be, He'd be right there thinking about me too. Hey, how are you feeling? You're good. You, you know, whatever the case may be, Mark was, Mark was right there. Just a fantastic leader. One of my, one of my favorite guys all time that I played with, just a good person. And, and what we did for each other, I think that we were both, you know, we played together probably almost a hundred straight games after we finally got moved together in New York. And it was just a pair that we liked playing together. We were comfortable. We, you know, complimented each other on and off the ice and on the bench. And that was an important thing for me. And you know what? Last year, it's funny because he gets traded to Detroit and I come back to New York and and I was kind of scrambled playing with different partners to start the season because we kind of didn't know they were going to move me to the left side or going to play the right side. We were all over the place. And it doesn't seem like a big deal when you don't have when you don't have that guy. But it, I missed him. I missed him right up the start, right at camp. I was like, well, who am I going to be with? I don't, you know, what am I doing on the left side? Now I'm back down on the right side. I'm playing with different guys. And it would have been nice to just be able to go into camp and have number number 18 on my left side. So, and it kind of was like that with Colsey this year, kind of got back into the same thing, right? You play with a guy like that, just a solid, really good player on both ends of the ice, patient, smart. And it makes it, it makes the game easier for you when you play with a guy that you know when you're getting a veteran guy and, and, a, and a good person that you like. So Mark, uh, Mark's the man. Well, I will tell you when I reached out to the, that trifecta, Foxy, Marco and Brady all said, Trip, you're going to love this guy. <laughs> That's what they said. Some might have had different terminology, uh, but they, you know, it was all, you're going to love this guy. Uh, <laughs> I just want to finish with, you know, you have a bunch of very talented teammates. You're an elite team. You played against Carolina. Like you, there were a bunch of new faces this year. But was there one guy that jumps out at you that was an opponent that now is on your side that you had observations from a from an opponent's perspective as a ranger and what you've learned now as a teammate? It's tough to pinpoint one guy because we play against these guys, right? So you play against them four times and then we play them in the bubble. You see a little more in the bubble. The bubble was a little bit uh, – Tough situation for us, though, you know, not to make excuses, but it was a tough situation. Carolina took care of business there. Um, if I had to pinpoint one guy, it's tough to say. There's, I already knew a lot of, you know, I know Pesh, I know Brady, I know Jesper Faust and, and Ajo and Terravine. So I'm going to go with somebody a little, a little different. Uh, Nietzsche, to me, is is got the potential to be a top 10, 15 player in the entire game. His offense and the way he could carry the puck to neutral zone speed and cut back and turn and make plays and his patience and just the skill that he possesses. And, he can, and he's on the penalty kill, is which is not something that I would have remembered unless, you know, I was remembered him being on the penalty kill against me when I was in the power play. It's just he brings a lot to the game. And I think I don't even know how old he is. I'm, I'm going to say 20, 21 or 22. Nechi's the kind of guy that could be a top 10, 15 player in the league, in my opinion, without a doubt. This is the next couple of years. He's getting, he's getting pretty good. You know, he's pretty damn good right now. Just you're playing against him though, right? And you're, you play against Carolina. You're like, well, I'll hold Terrible and Jessica, Slade and Jordan Stahl. You know, the list keeps going on and on. And then when I got here, I was watching camp. I was going to use Jordo actually as the thing because he does so much stuff in the game that, that goes unnoticed unless you play with him. You know, because you only see it once every 20 games. You play him four times. But Nechi is Nechi's got skill like you never seen. He's he's super super skilled. He skates like the wind, and there's just uh, a lot to like about his game. And he works hard, which I love. I love skilled guys that work hard. Sometimes you get the skilled guys that they're looking to float to the outside and you know get their 
get the points and they get them, which is, you know, great. But I like guys that, that go hard too. And he kills penalties. So if he kills penalties, you know, Roddy trusts him to, to be a defensive guy too, which is what you need if we're going to win this whole thing. And, and a really, really impressive player. And his ceiling is, is sky high. And a good person, you know, being with you yeah, on the, great the flights and the bus, these two guys, Spatch and, and, and Aches, you know, I'm getting ready and I'm going to miss you getting on the bird to, to Winnipeg in a few hours. And I'm going to get right back on the bike. Cause these two, these two are trying to get me in one of these skinny suits that you can wear with these sneakers. Okay. Yeah. You got some style tone. I mean, what are your thoughts? Cause Andre and, and Marty Natchez, they love to wear them. Are you on board with these, these white sneakers they wear with suits? No, I'm more of a uh, classic. I like a nice, a nice dress shoe. You know, I, I think uh, a nice dress shoe is the right way to go. But they're the Europeans had their, you know, they got their style. They look good. I, you know, I don't love the white sneakers, but I think they both pull it off. They both look good. They come in with style. They got the, they got the skinny suits. They got the buttons down up at the front. You know, they think they're going to be on uh, TMZ at the end of the night or something. They're ready to go. Usually it's just Hurricanes Instagram, but they're ready to go for whatever's coming their way. They look good. Yeah, if I had a dime for every time that a European woman, an object of my affection, has said trip with an accent, why can't why can't you dress more like the Europeans? And then they go on <laughs> rip my style. Uh, finally, you know, we, we, we do it virtually every episode. But with regards to the cohesiveness of a team, Tony. How do you define and what jumps out at you? Because you're on digging in. What digging in on the ice, in the room, what it means. Yeah, digging in. This is a great spot for us right now to, for an example of digging in, like we talked about earlier in the episode here. Having going through adversity to me, everybody's probably said the same thing to you throughout the years, but going through adversity, tough times is is digging in. We have some guys right now. I use uh, I use Jordan Saul as an example. And you know, he hasn't been able to to score lately. He hasn't had a goal, but he's still one of the best players on the ice every night because he doesn't, you know, that's sure. I'm sure he's pissed about it. He hasn't scored. He's got chances and goalies are making great saves. And it's going to come. He's going to get hot. He's probably going to score eight goals in 10 games or something like that. He's, his streak is coming his way soon, but the way he's still able to not worry about it and and dig in, as, as we like to say, every night and kill penalties and win face-offs and dominate down low in the ozone is – that's that's why he's the captain of the team. That's why he's a leader. It doesn't affect doesn't affect his leadership. Doesn't affect his penalty killing. Doesn't affect his face offs or his the plays he's making. He just continues to to dig in every night. And to me, that's that's what it's all about, right? And things are not going to go your way. You're going to cry, and I don't even mind. The guy slams a stick or whatever. That doesn't bother me. But are you going to slam your stick and then quit, or are you going to go out the next shift and try to dominate and keep going harder and harder and harder until it goes in? So. That's what I like, and I think that's what we have a lot of on this team, and that's why I'm so impressed with these guys. And I think uh, as the year goes on and the games become more important, meaning, you know, super meaningful games, whether it's win or go home, I, I believe in the group that we have because of, uh, because of that reason. we got 20 guys that are going to gonna be that way. Rod Brendamore has had some very complimentary words about you. Actually, I spoke to him most recently on television in, in your return to Philadelphia. Uh, why was he now that you've gotten to know him, the NHL coach of the year last season? Yeah, it's easy. It's easy once you get here. I, I, I called around a lot about him when I was deciding what I was trying to do this summer. And, and it was just unanimous. Anybody he asked was Rod's the, Rod's the best. Rod's the man. It doesn't get any better than Rod. I think he just understands the player so much because he was a player for longer than mostly all of us that he just knows, he knows what players are feeling on a day-to-day -day basis and kind of what the, uh, when the time is to do what, you know, if he's going to maybe be a little harder on you or a little, little easier, what, whatever the case may be, who knows what's, you know, it depends what's going on. It's only 20 something games into the season here, but he just, he understands players. Like for example, as you know, you don't want to be talked to by the coach every day as a player individually, as a team, obviously he's going to speak to you guys every day, but individually you kind of like to, if you're doing well and you're, and you're playing well or whatever, you, he knows that players know what's going on. He, you have an understanding of your own game. I think everybody does. Maybe some guys are inaccurate. I, I, I doubt it. Most guys that you talk to are pretty, are pretty solid on their own games. Like they know, they know what's going on. 
and he understands that and he lets you go. He just lets you play. And if he has something for you, you're going to, you're going to hear it. But if not, you're, you're playing. And then you kind of know, like you understand this is, this is what's going on. I'm doing, I'm doing the right thing or here's what I need to do. And that's, that's how you coach a team rather than being on guys all day, every day, this, 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 that, and then guys are, you know, their heads are spinning. So he understands how to get 20 guys all pulling on in the same direction. And the most impressive thing for me is how he's able to get top, top end guys, which we have a lot of to put in the same effort every night. Doesn't, doesn't happen a ton. And I think you, you know, you can see that just from when we go play other teams, it doesn't happen a ton. And with our team, it's, it's uh, I've been here 20, I think it's 23 games now we played or whatever it is, 22 games. And it's, it's been every night. I haven't seen, there's no passengers every night. When I win every night, you know, you might not get our best effort every night, but it's the effort itself is, is there. And that comes from, that comes from Roddy. So a lot of credit to him. I've been very, you know, very impressed and, and happy to be playing for him. Super. Tony, I, um, I really hope to see uh, your mug at some point on this trip. You're mm-hmm. dearly missed. Uh, I'll be blunt, uh, what you did in November, what you did hitting the ground running as a hurricane. Uh, very proud to give you my, my shovel. It'll be to you shortly. And most importantly, to can't it. wait to get back in the lineup. Appreciate it. I'm looking forward to seeing you soon. We're digging in with Trip today, yeah. Today, yeah. Today, yeah. Today.